All right, thanks, everybody. All right, we're, we're going to go ahead and get started in just a few minutes. Uh, so uh, just want to welcome you to our discussion today about uh, education uh, and uh, uh, what we're calling a seismic shift in education. Uh, wasn't me. <laughs> Might have been Bill. Um, my name is Steve Hallowell. I run uh, Amazon Web Services uh, education as well as state and local government uh, group in the U.S. And I've uh, been with Amazon Web Services about a little over a year and uh, was fortunate enough to join uh, at the right time to help build the business. And uh, so what you're going to hear uh, is um, still a work in progress uh, from the Amazon perspective. Uh, but more importantly, you're going to hear from the folks that are out there on the front line of education today, whether it's in research or in education technology and systems, learning management, student information, other types of systems, uh, or in distance learning, one of the, the hottest and uh, uh, most aggressively growing and changing parts of education worldwide. Uh, let me give you a little bit of detail on the lo logistics of today's session. Um, so we'll, we'll do some brief introductions. Uh, I'm going to do uh, kind of a temperature check on what kind of folks we have here in the audience so that our panelists can uh, structure their comments appropriately based on who you are and what you might be interested in. Um, then each one of them is going to talk for you know, about 10 minutes, uh, give their unique perspective on, on uh, education and what's changing uh, and what the constraints might be and where the areas of growth are. And that will leave us uh, a, a little bit of time at the end, maybe 10 or 15 minutes at the end for your questions as well. Uh, and we'd like that session at the end to be as interactive as possible, so uh, we'll uh, uh, certainly save time for that and see what happens in that, in that later session. So um, to my right is, is Bill Howe. Uh, Bill is a uh, affiliate assistant professor for University of Washington in their computer science uh, group. Uh, like most people in education, Bill also has other titles, uh, other business cards, other things that he does. So, Bill, uh, if you if you wouldn't mind giving yourself a little bit of introduction as well. Uh, sure. There, we also have a group. This is mm -hmm. it on? So it's, uh, the, a group called the eScience Institute, uh, where we work on uh, sort of big data challenges for science and astronomy and oceanography and life science and so on. So I lead a group on scalable data analytics within the eScience Institute. All right. Thank you. Uh, so we'll go. Uh, left to right here. So next is Michael Chasen, founder, uh, CEO, and, uh, and now employee at large for uh, Blackboard Corporation. Uh, Michael, uh, you, you want to give a, a few other, I'm, I'm sure I can't do you justice, so uh, if you could add, add on to that, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Michael Chasen. I'm, uh, as a, uh, a good friend mentioned, the, the co-founder and uh, original CEO of Blackboard. Uh, I've had the opportunity over the last 15 years to now work with over 20,000 schools around the world, helping them establish an infrastructure for bringing their teaching and learning online. And one of the big changes that we've seen that we'll talk about today is just how that massive infrastructure that's supporting uh, bringing the learning process uh, on, onto the internet and now onto mobile devices is very quickly moving into the cloud and why it's important not just from a uh, infrastructure perspective, but also from a business process perspective. And, and we've, we've never seen change uh, moving this rapidly before in the education space. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, uh, Anant Agarwal, uh, president for edX. Anant, if you could uh, maybe add a few words. Sure. Um, I'm uh, Anant Agarwal. I'm the uh, uh, president of um, edX. Um, before edX, I was, uh, I was uh, a professor at uh, MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab, but I was the director of the uh, laboratory, and uh, I was uh, quietly working away on uh, the cloud computing and uh, building an operating system for clouds, uh, building uh, many core computing chips, uh, launching efforts on big data, and then uh, my life took a turn, uh, turn uh, in, into some place uh, strange about a year ago, and got myself into edX, and, uh, and I guess we'll talk about it some more today. Thank you. All right, so with that, um, I, I, just by show of hands, I'd like to find out how many folks here uh, work in the education industry today. Can, can we see some hands? Okay, uh, and of the folks here, how many of you are actually uh, employed through university or schools, school systems? Okay, so it sounds like or looks like we've got maybe a 50-50 mix between folks that are uh, working on campus or employed by the schools and folks that uh, we'd call ed tech or education technology companies that are offering solutions to 
universities or students or parents or, or learners uh, worldwide. So uh, I appreciate that. I think that'll help us uh, structure our comments a little bit. Uh, I wanted to get started this morning with just a, we've done that. We might have done that. Really? Okay. I wanted to get started this morning. We're having a... Okay. All right. That's okay. How many people want more PowerPoint slides? <laughs> um, we'll do with less. That's great. So I wanted to start with just a, a few comments. And, and uh, you know, it's, I, I, I'm hearing some really good feedback about the sessions thus far. And there's some really good discussions going on, going on around cloud, around Amazon Web Services, around various kinds of technologies. This session is actually a little bit different in that we're choosing to dive into a vertical. Uh, and so I wanted to just put some stats and some uh, things out there to get us all back on the page of what we probably do in our day job, uh, which is the current status of education or at least some, some figures and some things. We start, uh, when these guys start their talks, I think we'll, we'll all have our heads uh, right in the game on, on campus and, and thinking about learners and students. Uh, so. One of those numbers is just, just simple math, right? So the, the global education market is $3.9 trillion. And of that $3.9 trillion, and by the way, that's about 5.6% of global GDP. This is a, a, a lot of money that we all know about. Uh, and I think we all look to figure out how to apply that money more efficiently so that we have better outcomes from students and research as well. Um, in, the, in the US, about $1.3 trillion of that total is spent in the U.S. alone, uh, and uh, yet the U.S. is 25th out of 34 in math uh, and is 17th in science. 23% uh, of American 15-year-olds can't use math in daily life. I don't exactly know what that means, but it doesn't sound good, right? Um, spoken word teaching methods, uh, that interaction between uh, teacher and student uh, the relaying and, and, and transmission of knowledge and information between teaching, uh, teacher and student uh, really hasn't changed ever. Uh, and as a result, it, it does sometimes give us a one-size-fits-all type of approach to what might be a very varied uh, challenge where we've got different kinds of learners and different kinds of environments and different types of scale. 57% um, of college students took more than or it took at least six years to complete their four-year education. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands in this room, but it's, it's not a great statistic. Um, and on, the, on, the, on a more positive note, we're also seeing uh, a lot of movement and change and interest by educators, by researchers, and by administrators in how to effectively shift this, this business paradigm in education. Uh, and so I, I've been fortunate enough to see our numbers of, of Amazon Web Services customers uh, exceed 1,500 universities globally in just the very short period of time that I've been at Amazon Web Services. So it's really uh, gratifying to see that kind of action. Um, you know, we, we titled the session uh, uh, Seismic Shift, so I'm going to use a few seismic uh, words I picked up from Wikipedia. Um, I, and, uh, you know, so magnitude and intensity is often the way that you measure uh, seismic activities. Uh, I tried to educate myself on the math involved with that. Uh, I'm sure these guys could do that. I was a failure, so we'll just stick with words. Um, and, and essentially, some of that piece is we find there's a lot of buzz in the, in the education market around this potential and this opportunity for shift. Um, but I have to tell you, sometimes it sounds like we've been here before. Uh, when radio uh, was introduced and became prevalent in the United States in the late 20s and early 30s, there were more than 200 radio stations that were dedicated to education. A decade later, there were only 37 of them left. But there, were, there was a lot of discussion at that point about this is how we're going to educate our, our young people. When uh, television came along, similar type of thing. People got very excited, started talking about a shift, started talking about a paradigm change. Uh, there were many, many education programs uh, and, and certainly other, other types of shows and things on, on TV. Uh, PCs, same kind of thing. People get excited, you know. Uh, broadband. So we've seen, even over the last uh, 80 years, that 
we've, we've felt like we were at this precipice and this, this paradigm shift moment before. Uh, so sometimes I wonder, is it different this time? What might make it different? Uh, and so I do think there are some things that we all think about in the, in the industry, whether you're, whether you're a, a company making solutions or you're a university uh, teaching students or doing research. And some of those things are, are really heavily around convergence. Um, and that is uh, the low cost of content creation and content distribution that now exists through uh, broadband, internet access, those kinds of things that we have uh, prevalent across enough of the globe today. Um, mobile devices, certainly. The fact that everybody's got something in their hand or on their person that, that they can use to access content that's somewhere else in, in various different ways. Uh, certainly, and unfortunately, the macroeconomic factors that have occurred around the world uh, over the last four to five years has really caused us to relook education, the efficiencies, and, and where that spend goes. Um, I think another important aspect is the shifting social norm towards online education or towards a mix of on-premise, uh, what, what we call hybrid uh, learning and distance learning as well. Uh, I think that's actually uh, might be a game changer at this moment as well. Uh, and then lastly, I do think technology has something to do with this as well with regard to compute and storage and content distribution and, and those kinds of things. And I think that's, that's pushing us in uh, the right directions. So with that, I wanted to set this up a little bit. Uh, fellas, what I'm going to do maybe is just go, go right to left and we could, we could uh, start with a knot. Uh, and, and if you can share with us your own unique perspective on, on the landscape uh, coming from your you know, your, your direction with edX, and then we'll move down, down the line, so. Sure, um, let, me, let me just uh, start by uh, asking you all a question. Uh, everybody's into education, so this is easy to do. Uh, but let's pretend that this is not about education. Let's pretend this is about transportation. So think back to the last 200 years, and uh, let's have a shout out. What do you think was the single biggest innovation in the past 200, now let's make it 400 years, the past 400 years in transportation. Shout out. Steam engine, what else? Let's go. Airplane, what else? Cars, solid fuel, automobile engines, what else? Highway system. Railroads, solid fuel, rocket ships, inertial guide. The, the list goes on and on. We could be here all afternoon. Let me ask you another question now. So think back 400 years. What in your mind is the single biggest innovation in education in 400 years? And do not say PowerPoint, please. <laughs> PowerPoint was a step backwards. A print, I, was careful to say four, I was careful to say 400 years. The printing press, yes, was the single biggest innovation, was 500 years ago. So I said 400. I was careful. OK, so you get, you get the point. And uh, so, um, so edX, so what is edX? Um, so edX is a nonprofit venture formed by Harvard and MIT. Uh, to really change the face of education and learning worldwide. Uh, they each invested $30 million. Uh, and so think of edX. So I'm running edX like a startup company with a $60 million first round. Okay, it's really, a, think of it as a startup, startup nonprofit if such a thing exists. So our mission is to dramatically increase access to learning for students worldwide, while at the same time reinventing how we do education on our own, uh, on our own campuses. Our platform is going to be open source. Remember, we're a nonprofit. So uh, I'll be saying a few things, and you will think to yourself, uh, I, my, my colleague here will certainly think, are you nuts? Why would you ever do that? But remember, it's nonprofit. So some of the things we do uh, comes from that. So we're going to open source our platform so uh, anybody can use it and, and improve upon it and uh, things like that. Um, we are a portal, so you can go to edX.org. It's a portal where students worldwide can come in and uh, uh, take courses from a partner institution. So right now, uh, we have a number of partners, uh, MIT, Harvard, Berkeley, and the UT system. The UT system has 15 universities. And each of them offer courses on our platform under the X brand. So MIT courses are branded as MIT X courses. They have the same rigorous campus courses. Um, a Berkeley course, they're teaching an AI course, CS188, on their campus. On edX, it is a Berkeley X course. Uh, the name is uh, CS188X. So really, the courses are the same rigor as on campus. They use our platform to teach a worldwide course. You all heard of MOOCs, so this is a MOOC. At the same time, they <clears throat> commonly also teach a campus class in a blended model, and, uh, and students there take the uh, campus class on the same, uh, on the same uh, platform. And to give, give you a sense of uh, kind of the staggering 
sort of insane numbers here. Now, when we launched our first course on edX, um, this was, uh, seems like 10 years ago, but uh, was less than six months ago. Uh, this course was circuits and electronics, and uh, we were truthful advertisers. We said, you know, it has second order differential equations and complex analysis as prerequisites. This is probably one of the hardest classes at MIT, although we didn't say that. But uh, so I expected, you know, I, you know uh, 2,000 students, and MIT's president, Susan Hockfield, would call me up and say, Ah, how many students do we have? She was really concerned we'd get only 200 students because it would be embarrassing. So I said, if we get 2,000, it would be good. And I'll talk about technology and scaling, I think, later on in the discussion. But we had no idea. We built a platform from scratch and uh, over uh, you know, a couple of months, uh, hammered out by uh, you know, a couple of students in, at uh, CSAIL at MIT. And so we had no idea how we would scale to uh, you know, 2,000. But we said 2,000 is a good, sweet number. So we launched the course at midnight. And, uh, and within 10 hours, we had 10,000 students signed up from all over the world. And within a few days, we had 155,000 students registered for the course from 162 countries. Hmm. So that was insane. And the only thing, uh, not the only thing, one of the things that saved us was uh, cloud computing and, and Amazon and so on. And we'll talk about it. Uh, I'm sure we'll talk about it in the rest of this talk. How do you elastically scale to demand where you are? worried you would have 200, and on a, the sweet spot was 2,000, and then you're hit with 155,000, and you are you have two students and yourself doing this course, and you're saying, oh my god, what do we do? And it scales seamlessly and uh, pretty, uh, pretty nicely. So what does an online course on edX uh, uh, look like? So this really turns education on its head. Uh, we all go to lectures, and we sit down, and, and by the way, I apologize to be, I, I apologize to you all for doing this live in person, like in a lecture. I think when, when Amazon really does it right, it will all be online, and we'll all be doing this uh, you know, from the comfort of our own homes in our pajamas with our favorite beverage next to us, not having to travel here uh, to last week. I mean, that's what online is about. So, so with the courses, uh, each of our courses has, uh, we replace lectures with uh, what we call learning sequences. So we're inventing new pedagogies as well. A learning sequence is a sequence of video snippets, each video being five to 10 minutes long, interleaved with interactive exercises. So a student will watch a video five to 10 minutes long, and then they'll do uh, a little exercise, a finger exercise to check their understanding. If they get it, good. If they don't get it, they'll go rewind, they'll pause the video. Heck, they can even mute the professor. Okay, when's the last time you could do that in your campus class? And so let me ask another question. Uh, so in terms of these videos and learning sequences, given that all of this is online, we are gathering all kinds of data. So we have our own, so I used to do big data research at CSAIL. Now we have our own big data problem. We are gathering huge amounts of data. We have logs and logs of student data of hundreds of thousands of students. So edX now has a half a million students enrolled, which is uh, larger than the total number of alumni of MIT and Harvard put together in their respective you know, 350 and 150 year histories. The numbers are staggering. So the question uh, I ask you is, uh, what time of the day do you think most of the video downloads and most of the work that the students are doing is at? What time? Pardon? Evening. Evening. Any other guesses? Midnight. Between midnight and 2 a.m. Then why on earth are we dragging our students into class at 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock in the morning? And they want to do things at their own pace? So really, online learning lets students do things at their own pace. So we have these interactive uh, learning sequences where they watch videos, do interactive exercises. We have a discussion forum where we bring the social component into learning, where students can ask questions uh, on a discussion forum, and there are, uh, other students can like the question, upvote the question, instead of asking it again. And students are helping each other in learning. It's a huge part of learning. There's a wiki where they uh, collaborate. There's a student dashboard where they see their grades. We have an online laboratory. We bring the gaming experience into uh, learning, where, uh, as, as one example, we have a physics lab, a circuits lab, various kinds of labs where students uh, build components and analyze them, much like they would build uh, an online Lego system, for example. They get instant feedback. So they answer a problem, boom, you get a green check mark right away. You know, all of us remember homeworks in classrooms where we'd submit something and get uh, a response two weeks later. It wasn't interesting. And there are studies that show that instant feedback dramatically improves uh, learning outcomes for students. In fact, our students are telling us that this green little check mark, they keep trying till they get the green check mark, they tell us that they go to bed dreaming of the green check mark. <laughs> in fact, uh, uh, you know, one student said the following. So he took, uh, the student took our uh, course, uh, the circuits course in spring, 
And then this fall, he's taking the Berkeley course on software as a service. And, uh, and I was in the discussion forum checking things out. And this student had this comment to make about the green tick mark. Oh God, how I've missed you. <laughs> so instant feedback is, uh, is really a big deal. And, you know, and, and people ask us, you know, why, is this, uh, why now? Why is this happening now? And really there's a confluence of technologies that really enables, cloud, <coughs> enables this whole online learning, the MOOC phenomenon right now. Cloud computing is one. Uh, second is uh, the whole social experience, social networking. Uh, also, having lots of uh, computing power in your hands to be able to do online game-like laboratories is big. And of course, video distribution. Uh, video distribution is huge. We distribute video uh, using uh, YouTube, and uh, that is also huge. So a lot of the infrastructures that are available to distribute high-quality video, HD quality, where people can watch things at any place, uh, is really a big deal. And to wrap up in the last uh, 30 seconds or so, as I said, we expected uh, you know, 200, we would have been happy with 2,000, we had 155,000 students. So how did we survive? And the story is very simple. Uh, you know, I was in my office and uh, uh, you know, two of my uh, team members came up and said, Anand, we have a real problem. I said, what? And they said, uh, you know, we're up to 50,000 registrants. And it's going up by you know, uh, 1,000 an hour. So how are we going to manage? And so we said, how many, uh, how many so we, had, uh, we decided we we're going to do this off of uh, uh, Amazon and Amazon Cloud. And uh, so I said, how many virtual, how many machines have we allocated? They said, you know, we've done this analysis, you know, each student will interact. We had no idea what we were doing, by the way. All this was, you know, like this. And that, and, and, and the whole cloud computing is great for when you're trying to do this. And you have no, absolutely no idea what you're doing. And so uh, we analyzed it. Ah, each student will be on the site for this long. And, and we did all these ana analyses. We said, yeah, we need uh, 10 virtual machines. Okay? I said, okay, let's get 100. And, uh, and so as the numbers went up to 150,000, you know, we said, let's start with 100 virtual machines. And then you look at your load, and then you keep titrating the load down. And the elasticity uh, is just extraordinary. So we could launch this and get this whole thing going in two months. We didn't have to build a data center. So really, cloud computing was really a big part of uh, what, enabled, uh, what enabled all of this, and really brings it all back to uh, you know, the reason many of us are here today. All right. Thank you very much, Anand. Um, so, and, and you have kept us beautifully on track, by the way, just uh, a, a suggestion for the other folks. Uh, so, Michael Chasen, uh, please take it away. Great. Well, thank you. You know, th that same type of huge success that you've seen with anticipating only 2,000 people and suddenly getting, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, over 100,000 uh, people in, uh, in your system is not dissimilar from what many of our clients have experienced on, on, on one-off basis. To help everyone kind of understand the, the, the perspective that what we found a, a lot of our schools have experienced is they put more of their teaching and learning online. Uh, but back in, in 1997, when I started Blackboard, we would get a call from a school that had implemented our software, and uh, they, they, they call up our support uh, desk and they say, you know what, our, our system's down. We said, oh, well, wh when did it go down? They said, oh, well, it went down about four days ago. I said, four days ago? Your system's been down four days, you've been offline for that long a period of time? They go, well, we didn't get around to calling you, no, no big deal. Now. That was back in 1997. Fast forward just three, four years later, we get a call frantically from one of our clients, 2 a.m. on a Sunday. They say, oh my goodness, our, our system is down. So right away we say, okay, well, we, we want to understand how many uh, courses do you have on your system? They say, well, we have about you know, three or 4,000 courses. Every single course in our institution plus all the archive courses are now online. So, okay, tell us more, how do you use the system? We said, well, we put up not only all of our quizzes, but all of our midterms and finals are online. Every paper is distributed online. We require all of our students to do discussion boards online, and we grade them, so it's a huge part of our campus. We say, okay, well, you know, and, and what type of courses? They say, well, we, we use it to, to do supplemental education, so all of our existing courses have online components, but we're also running full degrees now online. I said, okay, well, now that we understand kind of the, the, the uses, it seems like you're, you're really uh, heavily invested in, in e-learning at your campus. And, and what's the infrastructure that you're hosting it on? They said, well, it's running on a computer under Professor Gleason's desk. And we said, oh, well, uh, it's running on a computer under Professor Gleason's desk. Well, they said, well, it started as a side project at my campus. Uh, one of our teachers in our computer science department either downloaded the software or purchased the software, and it started with just his class online, and now it's expanded to our entire school. And obviously, that type of an infrastructure uh, is not necessarily sustainable as the schools achieve this huge level of success that they're seeing moving their programs online. And that's still going on today. We see exponential growth with many of our clients. I mean, today people talk about every school has an online uh, component, but I think we're maybe at the, 
15, maybe 20% of the amount of courses and materials that are you know, going to be online in just a few years that, 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 are, that are actually online today. And so what we've experienced is many of our clients see every year an exponential level of growth. And, and let me help put this in perspective. You know, every single year, all of Blackboard clients put more courses online. And then they not only put more courses online, but they add more supplemental courses and put more online programs online. Every single one of those courses has a teacher that puts more course material online. They use the online course more. The new students that are coming to the school actually use the internet more and are more interactive in the course, not only now on the internet, but on their mobile devices. The school itself is putting more exams online, mandating in some cases that all of their content goes online. So every single year, we not only get more courses and more programs, more instructors, more content, but then the students also use it more. And that, that increase is what our clients see every single year. So one of the constant challenges that we've had as a company is how do you make sure that you know, we, we build our software to scale to that level, but how do we make sure that the institutions that are our clients and our partners have the right infrastructure to be able to achieve success with that software? And that's actually been Blackboard's biggest challenge. Now, one of the ways that we directly addressed it was we started um, putting together data centers. Blackboard now runs eight data centers uh, around the world, and about uh, just over a third of our clients use our hosted facilities where we're fully uh, outsourcing the management and the running of the, the solutions. And that does allow for a very large improvement with many of our clients because we have a dedicated team and the right hardware stack and infrastructure to allow these schools to scale. But still actually two thirds of our clients are, are, are running it locally. But even now the problem that we're experiencing is, is, is Blackboard software is now used in 65 countries around the world. We can't even set up enough data centers. And even when we are setting up data centers, one of the challenges is how do we even get enough hardware to be able to handle this huge amount of exponential growth that our clients are seeing every year. So we began having conversations with the Amazon Web Services team, uh, in particular Carrie Ann Naughton, who is someone who's been in the education space for a large number of years and was able to work with us to start to migrate a lot of our technology to take advantage of this incredible infrastructure that Amazon now provides. Uh, today what we're doing is it, it's a little bit of uh, a dual management. We're both utilizing our own data centers that we have, but at the same time starting to put some of those components up in the cloud, migrating more of those components into the cloud and the Amazon Web Services over time. But in particular, we're not focused on opening more data centers. So now as we're going into other countries, we're using this infrastructure that already exists and we're able to then focus our time and attention back into the software, into the analytics, into the things that are really, you know, we think most important to the school and, and so no one actually has to worry about what that back end is. Now this is an advantage not just for uh, our, our clients and, and not just for the company, but I, I believe for education overall. In addition to the challenge that schools have faced in putting their systems online, there's a secondary challenge going on uh, within education. And that challenge is how do schools themselves better connect or, or work together or share programs or leverage best practices? Now, lots of our partner institutions have done one-off arrangements where they've worked together to uh, allow their students to cross-pollinate in programs or, or engage in initiatives um, where they're putting uh, courses online together all under a single brand. Those are going on all over the place. But there's a bigger challenge and a bigger question. How do you create either centralized uh, content sharing among the uh, 6,000 plus institutions uh, here in North America uh, or uh, the hundreds of thousands of institutions around the world? How do you create centralized uh, accreditation or how do you create standards, uh, learning standards across uh, different school systems? And, and cloud computing can also help with this. So what we're starting to see is uh, many of our clients in conjunction with us, and again, looking at utilizing some of the Amazon Web Services, are talking about how do they not only move their infrastructure to the web, but do so in a more shared and open way so that when their technology is then in the cloud, that they can then utilize uh, additional standards to be able to share course material, content, and best practices in a way that they weren't able to do when all these systems were installed on these independent silos. Now, this change is all happening very quickly. Uh, and, 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 and I can tell you, I mean, the, the, the adoption we're seeing of cloud services within many of our partner institutions, I think, is uh, you know, quicker than the adoption we originally saw of, uh, from when, when people went from uh, client server to the internet. But this is happening at the same time that we're also seeing a huge focus in mobile technology. Uh, Blackboard also um, works with schools to provide their 
uh, to develop their mobile app. We, we have over uh, 400 institutions now whose uh, mobile app is all powered by Blackboard. And uh, again, what we see uh, that institutions are facing is some of the same challenges that I just talked about with their e-learning. They're getting usage that's flying off the charts, that's growing exponentially. They're wanting to put more and more of their services uh, on the mobile devices. But they're running into challenges because either they don't have necessarily have the expertise in-house or they don't have the uh, hardware to be able to manage the interactions between all these devices. So what we've been able to do at Blackboard is work with these partner institutions and again, looking to leverage systems very similar to what Amazon Web Services has to create a central stack that allows institutions to leverage work done once at all of these different campuses to start moving more of their services utilizing the cloud infrastructure to mobile. And, 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 and what's amazing and, and one of the reasons why I've enjoyed my job the most is because to see this level of change, not only from kind of the uh, um, localized infrastructure to web services at the same time that you're moving from the internet uh, to mobile, to see two giant waves of change coming over an industry that you know, maybe hasn't changed uh, a lot in 400 years, I, mean, I believe is, causing, uh, is leading there to be massive change now. And uh, you know, I think what you're going to see over the next year or two maybe actually causes you know, such an amount of change that there becomes you know, fundamental different ways in which people approach getting an education, allows costs to be lowered, or at the very least allows institutions to better leverage infrastructure to improve the quality of their services. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. So, Bill, why don't you uh, take us into the, the wild world of uh, research? Yeah, I guess I, so I want to talk about something a little bit different. There's a similar revolution happening that many of you are probably familiar with in science in general, right? So there's this notion of the fourth paradigm. How many people have heard of this, this concept? Okay, so this is good. So I get a chance to, to teach you about it. So the first paradigm of, of, of science was perhaps uh, observation, right? You sort of go out in the field and you make notes in your, in your field book. Uh, after that, the second paradigm was experiments, right? You could bring it back into the lab and recreate the environment out there in the world in your lab and study that. So what do you think the third paradigm might be? I'll give you a hint, it was maybe 50 years ago or so. Say it again. Uh, actually executing it. Uh, yeah, that's where I'm going, but executing in what particular way? The real world right here. I'm, I'm, yeah. Simulation? Yeah, so I'm fishing for fishing for computation for simulation, but yeah, execute. Basically, you have to be able to actually run the uh, uh, experiment in, in in that world. So, the fourth paradigm, uh, which was observed by uh, Jim Gray, uh, who was a researcher at Microsoft for for, for many years, um, what is that? This data revolution that we're experiencing here has the, uh, it constitutes an entirely new way of sort of doing science. This is data collected for a different purpose that you're discovering patterns in. Uh, for which you do not collect the data. So this is not hypothesis driven in that you sort of come up with a hypothesis, go out into the world, design an experiment to collect data to answer that one particular hypothesis. This is collecting data en masse, sort of wantonly, and then chewing on it through some uh, kind of algorithmic lens. <laughs> so this is having a, a foundational effect on, on research in, in the universities that, that uh, a similar effect in industry, in fact, uh, although perhaps a little bit later. So in 2008, the U University of Washington sort of recognized this uh, sea change that's occurring and founded the eScience Institute. And since then, we've been looking at trying to provide tools to scientists who are sort of working in this sort of data-driven regime. And sometimes this is as simple as adapting an existing tool that came out of industry for a little bit and uh, sort of fitting it for science applications. In other cases, it's, it's doing some more computer science research to come up with something altogether new. And so there's maybe four uh, ways in which the cloud has been instrumental to, to the work that we do that I wanted to maybe tell you about. So four sort of use cases for this. So the first one is, you know, what happens in research trickles down into the classroom. And in fact, shortening that gap between what happens at the frontier of research in the classroom is, is sort of the holy grail uh, in, in graduate education. And one tool we were able to build for, for folks was a, what essentially is a database as a service uh, um, platform, but recognizing that an actual raw database interface is not really what biologists are going to sort of use, right? They're not sort of about designing schemas. They're not really about uh, setting up backups. They're really about administering the database. However, writing fairly complex queries in a, sh in a fairly uh, concise language on data that they uploaded themselves would be a great capability. And so we put a shim in front of uh, database services uh, hosted on a variety of cloud platforms, including uh, Amazon, uh, and have sort of being able to find that biologists who don't write a, a single line of any, of any imperative programming language are able to write these kind of hairy 
14 line queries doing sort of uh, biological sequence analysis. So this has really democratized the ability to do analysis when previously they were dependent, in, in this data driven regime, they were dependent on you know, their, their staff programmer. Right, so everybody, you know, in order to do your science, you'd have to go knock on the door of your staff programmer and tap on their shoulder and ask them to sort of write code for you. And we sort of freed them up. Uh, more importantly, this tool has, or maybe more importantly, this, in addition, this tool has allowed uh, you know, the, the line between what's happening in research and what's happening in the classroom to be uh, all, all pretty much erased, right? So this is, as a web service, there's a URL associated with every query you write. So as soon as someone writes that query and saves it in the system in the lab, it's available over the web to anybody who has permission to see it, and so they can bring it up in a classroom and use it in an assignment right then, as opposed to having to sort of teach them how to go log on to the correct server and sort of teach them the, the uh, you know, Linux command uh, sh shell uh, and sort of sh to teach them where, where all the files are located in the file system and so on. Uh, and so we've seen that happening as well. There, there's been curriculum design, uh, classrooms that have been, or, uh, lesson plans that have been entirely designed on this, on this SQL share system that, we, that we've worked on. Uh, and now, how the cloud was important here is not just that you know, it's served online, and so it's a sort of, a, in one sense, perhaps a standard uh, uh, application of cloud computing. But the main thing is that, you know, as a university research project, um, we don't necessarily have the IT budget to support a scalable app, right? So this would simply not have been feasible uh, without the, the, the cloud platform. So we've had between zero and one developers, uh, you know, maintaining this thing and sort of running it at any time. And there's been essentially zero downtime across three years. Now, the users are probably not, you know, hundreds of thousands uh, at this point, but there are uh, many more that we could support with, with um, if we had to sort of build it ourselves on our own server. So this is an example of where the cloud has delivered something that just wouldn't have been possible otherwise. So that was maybe number one, is sort of, is sort of tool building for, for research and, and classroom on the cheap. Uh, so number two was, uh, you know, Google Docs for developers. Right, so what I mean here is the, the same way that a, that, a, that a document that can be edited in parallel in simultaneously by two different parties that are remotely located has been pretty effective for you know, creating these documents. You want the same thing when you're doing uh, uh, collaborative development of some code. And so a very common need is, we, is someone in one university has an idea, calls up their collaborator in some other university and says, let's work on this code together. The next step in the status quo is, somebody has to convince their sysadmin to offer security credentials on their hardware for that person, if this makes sense, right? Somehow you have to reciprocate. If you're gonna let me work on your code, you have to sort of open up your firewall and let me have an account on that. And this takes on the order of weeks, which is way too slow to sort of get some of these ideas rolling. So we had several examples of where, after emails and sort of waiting for things, you spin up an instance in the cloud, uh, you know, an ephemeral one instance, get the code there, and now you can both work on it uh, uh, collectively and see each other's error messages and hack on the same same code base right there. And this is a, a tr almost a trivial use of the cloud, but it's been absolutely transformative. And again, this is some, probably something that doesn't come up quite as often in industry because you're not sort of calling up somebody at another company and saying, let's go work on some code together, maybe quite as often. It's all the time in, 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 uh, in, in uh, academic research. Okay, so that's, that's sort of maybe number two. Uh, number three is, I guess, you know, trying to, it's, it's sort of impossible to overestimate the power of a graduate student with a credit card. Right, so you know what I mean. We, 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 this, this is the driving force. Is the, it's not the faculty, and it's not even really necessarily. Oh, maybe the postdocs, but but it's really those, those graduate students. And if, the more you can empower them to sort of go off on their own and try something out, uh, is 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 where everything happens. So if they have to say, I think I need this much computing resources. Can you go buy these for me? And six months later, they arrive at the loading dock, and then of course there are no sysadmins. It's just graduate students. So they they have to go, you know, learn Linux and so on. This was the status quo, and it actually still is unfortunately, but the more that they can sort of have an idea on the weekend and try it out on that weekend, um, it's powerful. And so the one anecdote I guess I was gonna mention was, well, uh, the, the science here is sort of fun, I suppose. They're, they're, uh, they do sort of Monte Carlo simulation to understand how muscle fi muscles fire, uh, and this is sort of in insect wings as well as, as well as in humans. But this is, it's a stochastic model, so you have to do this thing sort of thousands and hundreds of thousands of times uh, to, to get the signal. And so this is, you know, a single graduate student swipes a credit card, spins up a thousand instances, in a, in a, well, probably not a thousand, actually, it's less than that, but a, a many, many, you know, hundreds of thousands of trials across how many instances it was, you know, and in just a few days before the paper deadline is able to sort of get these, get these results, right? And so this bursty uh, nature of it is, is, is critical. One point I will make about that, though, is that there still is a, a, a sort of a funny money problem in university uh, um, graduate research funding, right? And this is in the process of being fixed by, by a variety of people, but let me just mention it to you and see if you have to counter this yourself, but every dollar that comes in in research funding is taxed 
by the university at, by this indirect cost rate, which is you know 54 percent at University of Washington. It's probably similar elsewhere. Uh, capital expenditures are exempt from this, so capital expenditures might be a big piece of equipment, or it might be a big computing platform. So if I bring computers into the walls and plug them in, consuming power, and have them consume cooling, and have a sysadmin has to monitor it, that doesn't get charged the overhead. Meanwhile, if I take a dollar from the federal government and immediately hand it to Amazon, where I don't pay power, I don't pay cooling, anything, that's taxed at 54%. So this is you know, not a level playing field. Even still, it works out economically to be, to be a, a, a slam dunk for Amazon in many cases. Not all, but many, in most cases. And without that uh, extra penalty that you have to pay, it's going to be um, you know, near, nearly, nearly every case. Okay, and so the last one I want to mention in the last couple of minutes here is uh, maybe the most important. So there's been a lot of articles lately uh, about uh, some concerns about the reproducibility of research. And in one particular case, um, there was a sort of complex computational sort of analytic method of uh, detecting cancer through genetic methods that turned out to not work at all. And there's some people who died because they had sort of Gone, it had been recommended chemotherapy by these, by, these, by these methods when they didn't actually work. And when you went back to try to reproduce these things, nobody really could. And, you know, as research becomes increasingly computational in this fourth paradigm, uh, it's embarrassing to me as a computer scientist that things are becoming less reproducible, right? It should be easier to rerun some code that somebody wrote than it is to go do a wet lab chemistry experiment, and yet it's somehow not. And the reasons, as many of you probably can, can imagine, is because of the complexity of the software involved and the complexity of the methods being involved is that they're, they're difficult. And so, uh, you know, an obvious thing to do that is not, not really being done, but I think can and should be, and there's a couple of papers about this, one of, one of which I wrote, is about, you know, if you, did, if you just did all of your work in a virtual machine on Amazon, and as soon as you had your results ready, you know, save a snapshot of that guy, and then cite that virtual machine in the paper that you write, that's at least, that's probably not necessarily good enough because it would be nice if you had some explanation and documentation, but it's a, it's a minimum bar for at least being able to save the crime scene, right, where, where you were done it, it, it completely intact. And not only is it the code and the data and the environment, hopefully, uh, but it's also a platform to run it on, right? If you, if you took a, a cluster of 20 machines that, you, that were required to run your experiment, how's somebody gonna recreate that? They have to go buy 20 machines. Well, not anymore, right? If you did all your work on Amazon, uh, uh, you, you could do that. So I think this has, this has potential to have a profound impact on like the foundation of science, which is which is somewhat at risk if you, if you browse around and sort of do some, do some uh, research to this. And so I'll, you know, I'll stop there. All right, thank you very much. It's some, uh, it's some great perspectives. I really appreciate uh, those comments about uh, research. So we've got about 10 minutes left. First of all, I, I wanna thank these guys. I'd like you guys to, to join me in a round of applause. Um, I think we were extremely fortunate to have uh, these specific folks join us today and, and share their very unique and different perspectives of, about education and about the shift that cloud computing uh, may, be, may be helping to augment or power in some way in education. Uh, so, and, and once again, we've, we've taken a look at that landscape from the perspective of distance learning through the, the groundbreaking work uh, of edX. Uh, through the aspect of uh, all of that heavy lifting from the uh, learning management system and administrative uh, systems that companies like Blackboard have performed uh, tirelessly over uh, decades. Uh, and then certainly